um, but when okay, and then I <laughs> and when the um, and when so when um, it, so it's been a, a, a long and interesting ride. I did retire, as I was telling Ted, right, be, or actually um, Andrew, right before the um, right before the uh, COVID hit. So I didn't ever get to do my retirement lecture. So here it is, my retirement lecture, like uh, you know, post COVID. I hope we're post pandemic, more endemic. So today I'm going to come and tell you about an obsession that I have had since I moved here 20 years ago, since I set foot in this remarkable place with its remarkable and unique tribe. And, I, and, and as uh, Ted said, um, let's see, I got, got, to go, got it here. I've got to say got it. Um, uh, the Utah Historical Quarterly uh, last summer published this paper. So you're getting some, some of the highlights of the paper and hopefully it'll be more less dry. Than, than usual, but I'm so glad that they were able to publish this because I've been working on it for 20 years. Some of you who are older may have actually seen me give this talk before. So um, when I first came to Utah, I noticed like many people um, that the streets are really wide. <laughs> and that is why, um, and, wh and why, and I was so wondering why that was because one of the reasons that I work on any kind, one of the research areas that I have is called urban morphology, which is the study of cities over time. So I look at what the past tells you about the future. Um, and it's very critical to my design and my philosophy. And I am very, very interested in how, um, and how um, a history of a place actually affects its current plans. Um, turns out that when I started studying the Salt Lake, uh, as I said, the streets are really wide. Does everybody know why they're so wide? Why? Who, who knows why? Team, team of, uh, I don't know how many horses pull a uh, fire wagon. Right, that's, that's one of the stories. Also another story is you can pull a team of horses without cursing. Um, all of the, all of which were uh, stories that uh, it were uh, started um, in response to the large, large streets. Um, so when I started studying this question of why the streets are so wide, I found out that there were many, many different anomalies about Salt Lake City that made it actually completely unique, not only in its origin story, but also in its plan. So um, I wanted to uh, just talk about. It's not working. It does not want to go. Okay. So I, I really have to go back to um, when we when we study this why this plan is the way it is, we really have to go back to something called the Plat of Zion. Who's heard of Plat of Zion? Anybody? Yeah, almost everybody. Great. So what what you may not realize is what kind of what kind of idea Zion was. Um, Zion uh, was a geographical calling. Um, so when Joseph Smith uh, uh, created the religion, he had the idea that um, people should gather in one place. And that gathering uh, and to establish this sort of geographical calling. So when you became a member of the church, you went to Zion. And Zion was an idea, not only a philosophical idea, but an idea about community and how to live together. Um, so they wanted to create these wholesome places where people would live. So when, when he made this idea, he created the Plat of Zion, uh, which was drawn in 1837, um, uh, was the two versions, one was 33, one was 37. Um, and it's intended for Independence, Missouri. Um, it, the Plat of Zion is an ideal plan. It's a mile square. Um, it is a, a, a city for 15 to 20,000 people. And the plan set out the dimensions of the blocks and the streets and the lots and the central location for temples. And you can see in the center of this image, that's the central location for 26 different temples, each of which had a different use. Um, it had um, uh, other public buildings besides the temples, but it had no commercial streets. Um, so if we look at this very close up, 
a little bit closer up, you can see some of the detail of how the city itself was supposed to be laid out. Uh, it has several ideas, but among them in terms of Zion, one was community self-sufficiency. So they really weren't going to depend on imports and exports from anywhere else. Um, and also self-sufficiency of the, of the people who live there, of course. Um, righteous and isolated from non-believers. So um, because non-believers were kind of a bad influence on, on, um, on the LDS members. And, and family and church oriented life, very wrapped up together and basically non-commercial. So this was the sort of idea of the city not only was it an idea, it was a regional idea, which I thought maybe you guys would be very interested in doing regional planning and all. Um, so the city of Zion was to be the center of a regional satellite of cities, not just regional, um, actually. Uh, so, so the first idea was that this is that unlike most places where you may have been in the United States, and maybe your grandparents or your great grandparents lived and worked on a farm. And so you're, um, so in those situations, the farm life was was kind of isolating. So people would live out on their farm by themselves. And then they occasionally, every two weeks or something, they would go into town to trade. I mean, my, that's where my grandmother would put it. We're going to trade. So um, so what, what instead, there were, it was more of a model called an agricultural village, which is the model that's a little more common in Europe, where people actually live in the town and have an allotment outside the town, where they where they actually had their their livestock and their fields, where they would visit daily, or they might send their old son out to feed the animals or something, and then they would have their the village life, where they would actually they would be able to go to church, go to meetings, you know, go to uh, um, help each other, um, you know, and so forth. So. Um, they had a community life. It was a communal idea. And so what they, but what Joseph Smith intended was for uh, for this one village of 20,000 people to be surrounded by fields and then it, to another one to be sort of laid off and another one to be laid off and another one to be laid off. So people would be living in this series that were connected. It's, it's really a real kind of garden city idea before the garden city. And, um, uh, and, so when this, um, um, this, so this common pattern uh, was really part of the parcel of it, um, and the central city was to be was to be the, the city of Zion, where there would be uh, uh, it was, but it wasn't to be much larger than the other one. So they were all just sort of the same big thing. Now when they when jo when Brigham Young came to Salt Lake, he indeed did do this. He sent off people to create new towns, all of which had the grid and all of which had fields on the outside of them. And many of them still exist as small towns and some of them have become kind of big like Tempe, Arizona and stuff like that. But there were about 300 villages that he, um, he assigned people to live in and move to and create uh, up and down the Wasatch Front and into Arizona and all the way into California actually. So, when when the um brenda yeah may i ask you a quick question um you you said that the the plat of zion was actually prepared or written by joseph smith yes and so was it yes actually yes and and did he didn't he draw have... it but he he made it he had it he had it drawn up it has directions around the outside but i didn't mention that all of this writing around the outside of it has directions like how many street trees there should be and how it should all and how what the orchard should be and what life should be like here and so and what all of the temples each of the temples it's all written on one sheet of paper so you take that as another clue for yourself Plans should all be one sheet of paper <laughs> if they're going to last for very long. And this Ted, was, Ted was just saying that this is it's like a general plan, and and most general plans are well more than one sheet of paper. As yeah, we know. When, when this was pretty, you know, yay big, but it's um it's also existing. Is if you want to go see it, well, I haven't actually ever seen it, but it's in the church library, so um, or they have a copy. There may be more than one. This is their copy. This is a copy of their copy, and it's online. And you can, and they actually have all the writing translated out too, because it's actually hard, kind of, kind of hard to read the writing if you just glance down at it. 
So anyway, here's all the temples. Okay, so how did Zion come to Salt Lake City? Well, of course, um, you all know the story, I'm sure, of how the Mormons um, had uh, many troubles as they came across, as they tried to settle in Missouri, and they tried to settle in um, in uh, Nauvoo, and they tried to settle in Illinois. It's, and so they, uh, they finally made their way out to Salt Lake City and um, settled what was an empty uh, land, which of course was not empty at all. Something like 15,000 natives lived in and around the Salt Lake Valley and the, and the Utah Lake Valley, uh, all of pretty much decimated over a period of about 50 years. So um, Brigham Young did meet with the Ute chief to kind of calm things down, soothe things over. And it was, you know, to their eyes, an opportunity to live out their faith in a place where there wasn't going to be the, the, someone with the power of the governor of Missouri to chase them away. So they knew where they were going. There were maps, um, there were maps, early maps. Uh, so they didn't like come over Immigration Canyon and go, whoopee, look at that. We could stay here. They already knew where they were going. So um, there were maps that showed um, this valley uh, and the lake itself. And as you know, there were uh, about 60,000 immigrants and one might even say they were refugees. As they came to uh, as they came to uh, Salt Lake because they had to rapidly leave Nauvoo, they, fifteen thousand people moved out of Nauvoo in a period of two months. So um, it was really a significant uh, refugee situation where they basically had to go a little ways, cross the river, camp, and and then over a period of year of uh, of um, a few years uh, move uh, uh, to Salt to uh, Salt Lake on a trail they actually, they, they created themselves along the Platte River. No. The microphone, is this a better microphone? Is that better? Okay. All right, there you go. So there were lots of people. And so one of the things that's really interesting about Salt Lake is how rapidly it was settled. Um, and you've all heard these stories and, and so forth. So when they got to Salt Lake, um, they um, um, they immediately set about, I mean, really immediately set about settling it uh, and laying it out uh, with this plan. And they used the Plat of Zion as their sort of go-by, um, as their model for this project. Um, this is really interesting. This is the original surveyor plat, we think, some people think. Uh, historians ought to argue over everything, so there's some argument. But um, um, it's a sheepskin um, on a roller, wooden roller. It's in the Library of Congress now. It was found only a few years ago in uh, some in one of the descendants of the early pioneers um, and the early of the early um, actually of the early surveyor, Orson Pratt. Uh, it was one of his uh, descendants. We found it in their attic. So um, it's been more or less authenticated. It matches a book they have that goes along with it, that's the surveyor's book. But it is really the sort of original plan of Salt Lake. And you can see that it's really not very interesting <laughs> from the standpoint. It's like a grid. So um, this is, it's really kind of an interesting story. Within days, they scouted the land for miles around. And here was sort of the land that they had the Jordan River, they had and that's City Creek Canyon I'm looking at right there that's sort of uh, on the upper part of this map. Um, and they identified a place for their new city. First city they laid out Temple Square and then they laid out another 134 blocks in a nine by 15 grid. And so here is the original sort of plant way in which they laid this out. Um, the blue square is the, is the um, is the temple. They originally were gonna make it four squares, which is kind of interesting because that's sort of what it is now. Um, but they, when they laid it out with the, with the 40 acres, because each of these squares is, each of these grid squares is 10 acres, um, they realized it was too big. So they, they sort of ground tested it. And then they decided to back and make it into one tenant. And that was where the action was for a long time. The temple was where the action Temple Square is where the action was, even though the temple wasn't there or the tabernacle or anything. 
So what are the other green squares? They were supposed to be green. They're still something like green. What are they? Parks. Yeah, well, what are they today? Sugar House. Huh? Nope, not Liberty Park, not Sugar There's House. There's one uh, West High. West High is one of them. Yep. Oh, East High is Ooh, South, South High. High. Huh? What? One is, is one East High and the other is the former South High? I'm not sure. Yep. Well, the West High is the one that's just a little bit north of the Temple Square, as you can see there. You oh, can come probably, on, you guys. You can probably uh, put the mic a little bit further because I okay. think All right, is so that better? Sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. One of them is Pioneer Square. Okay. Pioneer, Pioneer Park, sorry. And the other one is Washington Square, where the City Hall is now. Oh. Okay. So they're all much more closer. Yeah, we're thinking this, further away. <laughs> you know, so, okay. So that's the original plat, and you can note. And so, and then pretty quickly afterwards, they added two more plats, uh, plat B and C, which is the red and the blue one. The blue one was not terribly successful for a lot of reasons having to do with flooding and and um, and so forth. And then they added the avenues in 1857 um, to 1859. Um, and it, it, it was built kind of slowly because at first it didn't have any water. In fact, it didn't have any water until 1895. So that was really a problem of getting water up there. People carried it up by, by hand cart or by um, and by ox cart, and um, and so that was a that was a difficult thing. There's another square there. Any more guesses? That's not green anymore. Is it the cemetery? It's the trolley square. Oh. Okay. So um, they did have this kind of Philadelphia idea of having these green squares around, which were rapidly turned into not green squares. Um, and of course, Pioneer Park is where the pioneers settled originally uh, in the very first winter or so that they were here. Um, now, all of these are, and then the, to the south, what you'll see are the, what are called the big fields. And they are the places where people would go, as I said before, they would get an allotment in the big field and then they would, they would travel from their house inside the city down to their allotment in the big field and um, and that would be where they would have their agriculture and so forth. That was where the good land was. Questions? And what's the south boundary between the? Ah, excellent question. Ninth, ninth. Ninth south. Nine hundred south is the south boundary of the city, okay. of the city of the original city. There was a wall there at one time too, a city wall, one of the very only city walls west of the Mississippi, in the United States. And it was really basically a work project for the single men. Go figure. <laughs> Is there a reason they why they had that... a few too many single men for some reason? And um, and so they they basically started to build a wall on Ninth South. Um, I mean, I think, well, go figure. Anyway, so here it is, um, as it appeared about 1870. Um, and this is an illustration by Brandon Blue, who's a brilliant illustrator who has a great book called Mappy Mormonism. And if you don't have it, you really need it because it's really got so much great information in, in, in it. I recommend it highly. Yeah, you have is, it. Some people there, have it. I had a quick question. Um, sure. Is there a reason why um, like the original plat looks like the state of Utah almost like? I don't know. I just I don't no, know. I'm I'm pretty sure that it has to do with topography. Okay. I think they, if they could have, they would have made it. You know, they would have the temple more centrally, and they would have. Uh, you know, they would have. They started to sort of do it right, and then they just kept going to the south, and then they couldn't do the north, and so there there was probably a lot of like I said, ground truthing, but it all happened within days. I mean, days. They had this whole thing laid out staked out in days so you know after like a week it's done now that's how you carry out a plan guys I tell you what they don't fool around man that's about how long it takes for cities to get their general plans done right, right it's right. right it's about a week right it's about a week and and to actually put it on the ground too don't forget so it's 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 out there 
no comment period. Well, actually, there was a lot of comment uh, and and back and forth. They met daily. Um, they, the, the pioneers met daily to talk about all this stuff. And um, it was all, but but they had a leader who was quite strong, who would just, this is what this is what we're doing, you know, kind of lead. So this is about 1870, and you can see that the streets are laid out pretty much as they are, and then and the big fields in the background, and then there's also these other smaller towns like Holiday, and West Jordan and South Jordan. And um, and a, a little town called Brighton off to the west, which didn't survive as a town. And so um, these were some of the the sort of reaching out across the valley. But it wasn't just that; it was all the way down into Provo, and all, I mean, way down. Every people were sent all over the place to go. One of the things that you see here in the let's see, I might show you that. I guess I can point it right here. This is Warm Springs. And I don't know if you know anything about Warm Springs. Right now there's a defunct building there that the city owns. But it used to be a it used to be a hot spring and the and the when the pioneers came here, they would go, many of them would go up almost every night to sit in that warm spring and and um, you know enjoy themselves. And so uh, this is what it looks like today. It's still spurting out this green um, water, sulfurous water that's about 106 degrees. So, and right now it's pouring out into the street into a, um, anyway, Beck Street. So anyway, that's, um, let me move on. So if we compare, so one of the things I like to do is to compare one place to another. So I'm comparing the Platte of Salt Lake City in 1847 with the Platte of Zion from 1833. And here you can see that the squares are exactly the same size. Um, the extent of the Platte is much larger. Um, um, and, uh, and the lots are smaller. So um, the, um, and, and a, more of a close up of Pioneer Park, Washington Square, West High School's spots as they are today. Um, and of course, um, um, so that's that's sort of a comparison. The temple squares that were in the Platte of Zion are the ones in the black here. They are um, they were obviously um, meant to be public buildings that would suffice for the entire public buildings, the need of all the public buildings for this for this for this plat for the city. Brenda, yeah, was the idea with the public squares? I'm I'm thinking like a planner, right? But is the idea, hey, everybody should be within a half a mile of a park. You know, I mean, was there that kind of thinking? I don't know. They weren't part of the Platte of Zion. But um but they I think that they were influenced by Philadelphia. But they didn't really have a great understanding of how that worked how that was supposed to work. So it's weird. So here's the Salt Lake City blocks and compared to the Platte of Zion blocks. And this is a really crucial difference because when Brigham Young came here, he decided that the, the, the lots should be much larger. The lots on the right side of the Platte of Zion are actually a half acre, which are still pretty big, right? But the lots, the Salt Lake City blocks are two and a half acres each. So it's sort of like suburban development. And he and, and so the intention was that everybody would have their house and their orchards in the back of their house and maybe some farm animals and their livestock. Um, so it's a little bit off the pot of Zion. And so, and, and also because of the lack of density of the city to begin with, um, it was not able to fit the 17,000 people who were coming from Nauvoo. Um, so they had to expand it. That's why they expanded into Plat B and Plat C uh, so quickly. If they had used the Plat of Zion, they would have been able to fit everybody very comfortably in a mile square, but it would have been a much denser city because, um, because uh, Joseph Smith wanted these towns on their lot, their half acre lots, but each of them were to have about 10 to 15 people in each house. Yeah, so 
Okay, so we know that Salt Lake is unique in many ways. And when I study things, and I've been studying this for a long time, and I'm going to tell you my results. All right. So when I study things, and, and this is a called urban morphology, which is the study of uh, a place both over time, uh, which is this diachronic comparison, which means I'm looking at Salt Lake City in 1847, 1889, the going up and down on this slide, 1913, 2014, so on and so forth. Or I'm also comparing it across time. So then I'm looking at Salt Lake in 1847 and New York in 19th century and Savannah in the 19th century and other places. I'm looking at the different scales and these are all the same scale drawings. So you can see the difference between the scale of Salt Lake and the scale of New York. Uh, in the 19th century and the scale of Savannah, which was earlier, but this is a 19th century rendering of it. So um, it's a much, much, you know, less dense uh, arrangement. I'm very fascinated with the befores and afters. And this is, um, I think this is probably um, fifth east, um, third east, actually it's third east. And so that's before, and there it is today, sort of the same same view. So you get, you know, the mountains in the background. I'll do that again because it's always fun to watch it again. So, but you can see how much pollution there was too. Um, there's a lot of pollution in those times, a lot more than we have now. So here's my results. The streets are very wide. So. Uh, you know, people laughed when I said this the first time too. And I was like, what, what do you mean? You're laughing at my results of my re of 20 years of research. Okay, so this is 20 years of research. I'll tell you the streets are very wide. Well, how wide are they, Brenda? Well, they are so wide, but they were wide back in the day too. This is uh, around 1930. Uh, 1940, and you can see how uncomfortable it was to cross the street even in 1930 or 1940. You can see people sort of barely making it, uh, you know, before somebody's going to mow them down. Um, and so this is a street, this is looking from about 4th South up toward, no, not 4th South, 3rd South up to the state capitol in the background. Um, and you can see the water tower way back there. You can see the avenues um, and so forth. So, um, uh, yeah, so State Street, right? That's the, there's that building is still existent. Yeah, that's the Brooks Arcade. Yeah, that's right. Several of several buildings in this picture are it's, still, it's still the there. Beans and Brews building. Oh, literally, that Beans and Brews is there. But yeah, anyway. it, there's a Beans and Brews in there. And so it was a coffee shop then too. So go figure. Okay. <laughs> I thought it, I thought it said coffee, but I was like, it can't be. It's a coffee shop. That's crazy. Yeah, there was a drugstore and a coffee shop and all this stuff. So anyway, um, um, so the streets are really super wide, and um, they were always super wide. I mean, you know, and so people were like, well, why did they turn the streets? Why did they? Why were these streets so wide? And the answer is not because you can turn a oxen around in it because you can also land a 747 here too. But that doesn't mean that that's the reason. Um, the reason is actually because of the Plat of Zion because the streets in the Plat of Zion were 132 feet wide. And that's why these streets are 132 feet wide because they just went ahead and followed the Plat of Zion. Um, so here's the street with comparison. This is done by Stephen Goldsmith and Ann Forsyth. Some of you may know Stephen. Um, and um, you can see that even the Ramblas in Barcelona is not nearly as wide as Salt Lake City streets. Fifth Avenue, you know, these are all, you know, Main Street Disneyland is way more of a, of a model, you know, but anyway, these are, this is a really interesting scale of how, how we have such wide streets. Okay, here's a second finding, which is the blocks are very big. Uh, I am for obviously not the first person to figure this out, as this is from also from Goldsmith and, and Forsyth. And I think they did this study in like 19, I mean, um, 2001 or something like that. So a long time ago, comparing the size of blocks of Portland, New York, and so forth. Um, 
to the size of blocks of Salt Lake City. Um, so that has a one, at least one transportation concern, which means we actually have a lot fewer streets and a lot narrower. We have a less laneway than most places do because we have more land than street. And, and that's, um, that's not true in most places as the proportion is different here. I'd have to get a contract from you to figure out what it is though. Well, and, and to that point, that's why there's been a lot of effort made at mid block crossings and, and um, street connectivity. Because if you have those really large blocks, it makes walkability much, much harder. Much harder, yeah, yeah much harder. So, um, so the other thing is a finding is that the lots are oriented in opposing directions, which is also part of the plat of Zion, which is means that, that from one block to another, you don't have any continuity. You don't have a continuity of frontage. If you wanted to put down a house, 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 the way we're used to having that kind of continuity, you couldn't do it because you're really, you're basically every every block is turning a different direction. And uh, the idea behind that was that when you had your house and you had your lot and you had your 20 kids, um, you were looking into, you weren't looking into somebody else, you weren't facing across the street from some other house. You were facing across the street from their orchards or their gardens, and so you had this green aspect out your front door. Um, and that was that was actually, you know, a stated goal of this. That it's more green than it was. So this is this is, you know, if we compare the block size and the lot size, look at the lot sizes in Cincinnati at the same period. Um, where you have very tiny lots that were um, commercial frontages with about 25 foot commercial frontage and about a 75 foot rear. And that was sort of normal for the, for the period in terms of how urban development was going at that period. Here's one that people don't think about very much. Um, the city foundation was unusually extensive. So when Salt Lake City was was created, as I said, um, it was fairly undent, was not very dense, but look at how it compares to the uh, initial plat of Waco, Texas, and that's the same scale, <laughs> same scale, and, and, the, and the initial plat of Cincinnati, Ohio, neither of which grew very much um, in, the, in the first 50 years or so that they were in existence. So um, you look at Salt Lake City's plat at the same period and it's like enormous compared to these other places and that has also implications which we'll talk about so when the city evolved so here's how i study it this is um block 70 if you know the block numbers if you don't this is first south and second south between main street and south and state street and right now they're building a 49 story tall building on the corner here so on this corner so you know what's going on there. But if we take the original um, subdivision lines, we will see that they persist through all of the world of time um, that we've come to so far. And this is very common in urban morphology that, the, that there are certain structures of the city which last a very long time. Luckily for you guys, transportation structures are one of them. Transportation structures can last forever. So you can go visit Manhattan, for example, at the tip of Manhattan, and there's not a single building, but almost every single street from 1665 is still there. So you have Wall Street where the wall was, you have Canal Street where the canal was, and so forth. So the, all of those streets still exist. So if you're building streets, which we presume you guys are, this is really good because then you can be more immortal than the architects who build the cathedrals. Well, well, good and bad. Yes, good and bad. That's right. Right. And, and yes. Because now as we seek to make modifications to, you know, to what was done in the past, it's harder. Absolutely. Streets are very, very hard to take down. In fact, um, and, and this is sort of, a, sort of a side, sorry, I'm getting way off the topic here and, you know, I'll never get through it. So it's okay. We'll just, we'll just wing it from there. But, um, but the, um, after they bombed Hiroshima, guess what came back? The buildings? No, the streets. 
almost the exact street network that they had before. So when the fire of London came and wiped it out, several famous architects did new plans for London. Eh, they just went back to their old streets. Now, why is this? Why are streets persistent? Anybody know? Anybody have any theories about that? Because people do have theories about it, but my theory is that basically, because in the, in the modern day, at least, they are the definers of property, number one. And number two, they also contain all of the utilities. So they are the infrastructure. They're just, they're more than just a street, the surface of the street, or a lot more. So that's, that makes them extremely persistent. Now, why are the lots so persistent? Lots are very persistent as well, because it's very hard, you know, a building can be built on any of these lots that you see here and be torn down, but actually changing the lot Imagine how you have to do that. That's pretty complicated. You know? Yeah. I would throw onto that, that that streets are sort of a community expectation, right? So like what's on a parcel is something that one person can kind of take and run with. Um, but like they will probably get this sort of like, like mindset that, that that's the way things need to be and everybody shares in that mindset. Yeah, that's and and they're and they're mo most usually community ownership as well, so that's another another reason they're communally owned. So getting rid of them is tough. We have only gotten rid of a couple streets in Salt Lake since it was since it was created, um, and we haven't really gotten rid of them. They're still um, they're still the, the main street just north of in the Temple Square area has been closed, and there's been a street closure over by the. Um, um, convention center, but basically they're still in public ownership or quasi public ownership. So here's what happened. Even before, even before anybody set foot on these things, they started subdividing them and they set, and they subdivided them um, before they built them, before anything was built. So they took this one big block here and they turned everything sideways and built Lamb's Cafe and other things in there. Um, and then they built, uh, and then they subdivided over here. And so, um, and this long skinny one right here actually belonged to Brigham Young. So um, uh, that was, the, so they weren't really very concerned about this um, religious plan, a religious inspired plan. Um, they, they immediately began subdividing. And here's another example of how they subdivided one of these lots on the end, which is very, very common. Um, and by 1889, all of these, um, you can see where what, what used to be, what what was wanted to be one building became a oh like 15 buildings along here and again this is this is right about where lamb's cafe was right in here this is regent street and regent street was not planned to be a street it it evolved to be a street and if we go back and look here it sort of started with brigham young's little parcel there okay and so it evolved to be a street. Uh, another street is gonna evolve right here and I'll show it to you in a second. Um, the, the, all of these inner streets, all of these alleyways are because the blocks are too big. And so if you surround the edge of the block with buildings, which they did in this sort of case, um, you still don't have enough, you still have a lot of empty space in the middle. So they started to create frontage in the middle. And here it gets really seriously built out in 1911. Lots of cities did in, this, in the early, 19th, early 20th century. And you can see um, there's, a, there's Regent Street, which has really become a very hard street now. And then other streets that are commercial street, and I'm mean, not commercial street, but in other streets, this is Plum Alley, which goes under a parking garage right now. It's still there. It's got a street sign right here. So if you want to go check it out, okay. Um, and then, and then it, from here it goes downhill. So this is this is this this is the Lamb's Cafe edge right here. Um, this is uh, this is um, uh, Plum Alley, which is actually the Chinese um, um, part of town uh, in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th, um, early 20th century which was of course um, destroyed 
So there it is in 1950, pretty intact. This is still Plum Alley with a few a few tenements in it. So you wonder why wonder why Salt Lake doesn't have any sort of taller wooden tenements like other cities do. Well, they did, but they're gone. Um, and so this is what happened in 1969 when excuse me, oops. Well, same thing. So we have a big parking garage, and now we have a project going on the corner of uh, of uh, State Street and Second South, which is a 49 story building. So, but uh, what's interesting about this is that many of these are still contained within these original lots. And this whole big theater project was contained within two of those original lots. And not only the theater, but the other 45 story building here. So there's Regent Street today. And this is a building right here on the edge of Regent Street, which still exists uh, from some of these earlier drawings. And if I go now, if I go to another block and sort of in the in the center, more in the center, this is 200 South, 500 East, 600 East, and 300 South. You'll see that it it did get a little bit more um, uh, by eight, even by 1889. It's not very much developed. So it's got it's got a lot of houses along the edge. So it was subdivided along the edges. Um, so these houses, well, they had kind of a problem. What are they gonna do with this stuff in the middle? All right. So uh, what they did, um, so this is 1898, not too far, not too long. This is actually where uh, Envision Utah is. It's just to give you a little, I'm sure some of you know where that is. Um, it has been for a long time. So, and some of these older houses still exist over in here. Uh, but pretty soon they started building the, what I call mews, little streets all on one block, on one original lot, right? With all of these houses, little tiny houses sort of sitting on this one little street. So they would take advantage of this. And this is how the alleys of Salt Lake developed. They were not built as alleys, they weren't planned as alleys. They were one person who decided to subdivide up his land and build little houses like this. These are not here, these are, these are gone, but there's all, they're all over the house, they're all over the place, these little streets um, in the city. And then of course, as, and it, that, that sort of tendency continues more and more, these little streets are built. Um, but by 2019, we have a very few, very, very little of the original um, fabric is, is still there. Mostly it's all mixed up. Now, this is one of the reasons why I was curious about Salt Lake to begin with is all of this mix of land uses and mix of sizes and mix of everything. And so my theory is that because the site, the, the buildings were never built in a early way to begin with, that they were very vulnerable to being torn down and changed and moved around and made into sh little shopping centers and and hospitals and and um, you know doctor's offices and convenience stores um, because they didn't have a solid sort of start because they weren't ever built because this lot layout was never the right size so when you build a subdivision you build a house 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 very solid structure that structure is not going to change. This structure is not a solid structure, it just evaporated. So there's a sort of heterogeneous, that's this little street frontage right here today. So if we go back and look at the city as it grew again, um, here's Plat A, Plat B, Plat C, uh, the um, avenues, which is half the size, by the way, of the of, uh, Salt Lake City grid. In fact, it's so much half the size that they didn't even line up the streets. They just made, they just took the grid and they shrunk it and they put it there. And what happens when you do that is that the streets don't line up. Which is like, hello. But anyway, um, the streets are half the size, the lots are half the size. The, uh, and, and actually this is the same size as Nauvoo and pretty close to actually uh, Ogden too. So, um, so if you look at what happened to some of these areas later, um, in the city, so here okay, we get. Just as an observation, I I never knew why it, um, 
uh, is it South Temple that you go from, you know, the numbered streets to the avenue, the lettered streets, why the streets didn't match up until now. And now you know. it's funny because we think, oh, Plot of Zion and, and the city was all so planned out. And in some ways it was, and in some ways it decidedly wasn't what was happening. In some ways it was a blocks. failure as a plan. Yeah. In many ways it was a failure as a plan. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a okay, second. Sorry. I, sorry, I don't have much time here. So if you see how Salt Lake developed over time, eventually we, we got to the west side. We didn't at first because the land on that side was very bad. It was uh, uh, chalky and uh, very little water. Um, even today, it doesn't get the fresh water that comes down from the mountains. Um, so as you know, the water in, uh, over there is drilled not um, as, as wells and so forth. So, um, so you, you know, we see that there's certain boundaries that happen um, that are common. Here we have, uh, and I'll, I'll zoom in on that just a little bit. Wait a second, here we are. I'll show you this a little bit. So this is, uh, this is Sugar House, always very interesting. Ninth South, the big fields got, and here's sort of the, the how the big fields were originally divided up. And uh, Brigham Young owned all of this big field, all of the ones in this one. And so he eventually gave it to the city and that is um, huh? Liberty Park, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Liberty Park. This is Liberty Park. So it's pretty big. And so if you ever wonder, which I always did, why the streets count like 9, 17, 21. Okay, this is why. <laughs> so exciting to find these things. You know, so this is 9th South here. This is 17th, oops, that's 17th, that's 21st, I mean, um, 9, 9, 13, 17, 21, 9, 13, 17, 21. So that's why those are the only streets that went through in the original plans, okay? They were the streets that were uh, part of the big fields. They were just cow paths, you know. All the other things were subdivided as they were built. And so there's a big hodgepodge of, of streets. However, um, because they were subdivided as they were built, um, they were built to, to fit the houses that were supposed to go on them. So these little cottages were built all in through Sugar House, very solid, very, very substantial, did not, did not have any kind of the variety uh, e even today, they don't have the variety of uses. They don't have the variety of sizes and shapes and everything. They're very, they're a, what I would call a solid structure um, because they were built at the right scale and the right size for the things that were going to go, were intended to go on them. So there were lots of people who built a subdivision. There was a, a sort of subdivision right in here that's pretty well documented. You know, different how somebody would take up, take up a couple of these lots or five or six of them and build their own little subdivision. Okay. So um, to sum up, I'm sorry that you have to little, sorry. Um, some of the choices were religiously inspired like the grid size, the street width, then the size of the lots. Um, again, uh, it was not, it was Brigham Young's decision perhaps because he was uncomfortable with the kind of density because being a country boy himself. The orientation of the lots for privacy um, the temple is the center of the community. There were wards of nine blocks. So the nine block pattern uh, also persists uh, in, in the city. Uh, there was lack of a co commercial district. There was commutarianism. So they didn't really have a commercial district. So that sort of developed on its own. Everything was unplanned in a sense that eventually happened. Um, there was a disconnect between the concept of Zion and Brigham Young's more rural leanings. Uh, the unworkable scale of the block led to irregular solutions and sort of like a free for all in the subdivision, the high variety of build out. Um, the problem of the wide streets was a problem even in, in the 19th century. It's a problem in the 20th century. It's a problem in the 21st century. Um, and uh, as an undifferentiated grid. So there's really hard to find centers and nodes and anything else, you know, you, where, I mean, it took me years to figure out third and fourth and fourth and third, and, you know, did, I'm sure everyone has this same problem, you know, you know, 
we don't have sort of any differentiation of what's going on around here. So, but on the other hand, sometimes these blocks seem to be a modern day idea, which is that our large blocks support the very large topologies that are happening in the 21st and 20th, 21st century, which is, you know, convention centers and we can fit a basketball arena in our block, which nobody else can do that. Nobody, not one city can do that. All right, uh, shopping centers, big box stores, parking garages, high rise, plenty of room in our box for all that stuff. Hmm. So we don't have to close streets to do that. We don't have to mess up our street system. It stays the same. Um, so that again, the lack of pattern internal to the block provides the flexibility for all these changing types. Uh, but the pattern of the blocks in the streets is very persistent. It has, has resisted major changes, which is good too, because it resisted a highway that wanted to go through it um, when they wanted to build a highway that basically became, um, um, that was sort of uh, through the avenues and down past the university and down Foothill Drive, that was a big proposal, but this there are kind of grid kind of resisted that, whereas other places had breaks in their grid. We didn't have any breaks in our grid. Our school was solid. Um, and the large extent of the plan, it really protected it from severe disruption that other places saw in the 19th to 20th century of highways and rails and so forth. So are the wide streets okay? Well, maybe. <laughs> okay, so first of all, that we develop these alleys and these mews that provide a very alternative scale. This is Regent Street. Um, and it was already a nice street back then and it's still got some potential. Um, and now we have the potential of building complete streets, which all of you know what complete streets are, so I don't have to explain that. And also streets for, can we can use our streets for pu multiple public uses? Because we have these mews, we have these opportunities for, for a variety of scale within our blocks. Here's the industry proposal that they're gonna take over. They're, they're on, where are they? Seventh South, between six and seventh South, take over their street. They wanna take over the street between their two parcels and make it into just a little tiny street with a bunch of things in it like racquetball courts and not racquetball, pickleball courts. And I hope they get around to that and, and uh, other sort of things. So there's a potential to do something with some of these wide streets. Uh, it's east-west, let's see, it would be fifth, maybe between sixth and seventh. It's about sixth west too. Okay, sorry, there we go. I'm sorry, I can't move through this fast. It goes at, it goes at the speed it goes. Okay. So really, ironically, um, one of the most interesting urban designs is the large trees that were built uh, that were built along the streets and most of the and most of the main part of, of uh, the city and the original plats, some of which persist, hundred year old street trees, um, and which need to be uh, taken care of. So I want to answer any questions you have if you're still around, and um, just tell you that I have a new blog called the right place pro and <laughs> if anybody um, wants to you know it's brand new so and nobody links to it yet so google hasn't found it yet so you know oh i'm gonna yeah. figure that out <laughs> <laughs> yeah brenda the oh yeah let's let's give brenda a, a hand. <laughs> yeah i didn't even look at this thing <laughs> One question. So it seems like there it's this hybrid concept of, hey, let's be a village and let's be agriculture. It's this agricultural village. Um, was that kind of just a idiosyncratic idea? I mean, have we seen that before? Yeah, it's it's actually pretty common in in Europe. It's a European model, really. Um, and and there's other places where there are agricultural village, but but a, a European model where you would live in the village because that was a supportive atmosphere and it was also protective from like raids by the other villages, you know? Um, so, you, and you would have a wall around your village. So you would have your wall and you would live in the village and then you would go out of the village and have your agriculture. And then if something was happening, you went back into the village, obviously. So there was a, there, there was, it's more common with a old, 17th, 16th, 17th, 15th 
century idea where uh, walls actually meant something. And when they invented cannon that went over walls, had it, all of a sudden we stopped having walls. Yeah, very few cities in the United States had walls actually, so. I know we have folks that are online and if anybody online does have a question, let us know in some way. Um, anybody else in the room here? I would, I just want to know, it's really interesting to me, Brenda, the, I did not realize that we had larger than average lot sizes within the blocks and sort of how much challenge that created for us. Um, but then you also noted how the, the sort of permanence of the blocks actually creates opportunity, not just for building a convention center or whatever, but for rethinking uses within those blocks. And I wonder if you feel like, are we doing enough with that? Or is it, you know, does it create an opportunity for us going for, not just in Salt Lake City, but any of the, uh, Marcia and Ogden, I mean, you know, any of these places. The other, the other places are not on this scale. I mean, Ogden and, so, and, and Provo, all of them are smaller. They're all more like the avenues. And, um, and actually, in many cases, they were planned like avenues blocks, which are pretty big too. They're still pretty big. Um, um, they are five acre blocks and they're, they were originally um, put into um, four blocks, four lots per block. So even then they were over an acre and there are very few uh, lots that are persistent from the avenues that are that size, a few, but not not very many. Even in Salt Lake, there's very few lots that are the same size as they used to be. I mean, if you look at Harmon's, you know, Harmon's sort of sits on one lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about it, it's like, what were they thinking? <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Um... So I don't know. I don't know if I'm imagining this or not, but in my adventures downtown, I've noticed that there aren't very many alleys downtown. There are a lot of alleys, and I actually skipped the slide here. This is this is all the alleys that are existing in Salt Lake City, in the main ABC blocks. There's over a hundred of them, okay. and there, and you can see there's no rhyme or reason or order to them. Some of them are streets. Some of them are walkways most of them are streets um some of them are not owned by the city some of them are private some of them are regent street and they're like you know really fabulous and um but there's um there's a lot of them and they are unique to salt lake in the sense that they're not planned they're all they're all they just arise they arose from the development of the block and so that's a really interesting opportunity throughout salt lake uh, is the preservation of these alleys and some of the preservation and even now they're the ha li the little houses that are on them and there's tons of them I mean, just if you if you see one little street like this okay on one block it's going this way look around the corner turn the corner and look the other and you'll find that pattern sort of persists everywhere where they sort of go around the blocks like this and they're not alleyways, not all of them, not very many are actually alleyways that go all the way through the block. Lots of them go halfway through the block and terminate. I guess I would refine it to be like non like neighborhood, more like downtown. And it doesn't seem like many of them are accessible. So maybe that's because they're private, like you just said. Some of them are private. Some of them are, some of them are private and have not been, they're not um, taken care of. So they're not paved. And they're, or they're paved, but it's really like been 20 years since anybody's filled the potholes. And so it's, it, it, they're, 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 in, they're not valued. I mean, if we see Regent Street or some other streets like that, we realize that they should have value, right? Um, but um, the, lots of times they do not. Um, in, in Salt Lake, they do have a plan now that preserves what they call the mid-block walkways, which are not just walkways, obviously, they're also streets, but also creates new ones as people are developing. So that's another, it's, it's sort of another random creation, part of what a, a random, random opportunity for creation. 
uh, in the middle of our blocks. So we, we're building streets all the time. I mean, you look at the fleet block, we, we need to build a, maybe one, two or three streets in the middle of the fleet block in order for it to have the right scale and size for a city. So you very likely know better than anybody here, but I, I assume that Salt Lake City in their plan for mid blocks, they're building off of that fabric of those alleys. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, they are. Okay. They, they're building off of it, but also they're creating new ones where certain, where they've been sort of deteriorated in this area. Oh, right, right. You know, where it's really kind of, um, down on um, um so, so there's there's been a lot of new ones created that were really created because of the because of the um the need to do um to have inner inner blocks excuse me the blocks are still too big it, unless you're building a convention center if you're building like affordable housing or any kind of house any kind of you know any four-story five-story housing apartment block you need you need more streets and you need a higher network of streets in order to serve those buildings. And so people are building into that network and they're building into that network a lot all over the place. So. Any other questions before we wrap up? Do you care if we send the, the recording out then to, uh, to others? We have had a few people ask for it already. Sure. I, I don't care. No. Okay. Just link to my blog. Yeah, right on. <laughs> the right place dot pro. It is Thanks. not really I don't you know, if you go there and it's like you know, forgive <laughs> me because you know it's hard to build a blog. I'm I'm doing all my own web design and it's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not the best idea, but I'm retired, but also make it easy. Brenda, thank you so much. Let's give her a hand. You're welcome. Thank you all very much for, for